This podcast contains explicit content and discussions related to real-life criminal activities, including violence and sensitive topics. Listener discretion is advised. The host's opinions are personal and are not representative of any individuals or organizations involved in the cases. Please strive for accuracy, but if you've missed anything, please let us know. Thank you for listening. Skylar Nice thought it would be the perfect night for a joyride, sneaking out to roam the town with her closest friends by her side. I mean, what could go wrong? But little did she know, what she thought would be a typical night of sneaking out and fun would turn into a nightmare, betrayed by her own so-called friends in the most cruelest way possible. Unbeknownst to her, her friends had other plans for her that very night. This trip would end up with only two of the three girls coming back home alive. Welcome to Rotten Minds. I'm Kay. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode and since you're here already, please support the podcast by following and rating our show on whichever platform you're listening on. And with that, let's get into today's case. This episode contains graphic depictions of violence and other sensitive topics, so please listen with caution. Skylar Nees was born on February 10, 1996 in Morgantown, West Virginia. She was a cherished only child of David and Mary Knees. Described as a bubbly and a humorous soul, Skylar had a knack for always making people laugh, especially her dad. In one memorable moment that her dad recalled, when Skylar was young, she decided to host a tea party for her dad. Pouring him a cup of tea, which was actually just water, they sat together, enjoying the pretend tea time. Impressed by her tea-making skills, David praised Skylar, filling her with pride. Later, when Mary returned home from work and David shared the story, she revealed a surprising detail. Skylar was too short to reach the sink, and she had been getting the water from an unexpected source. Can you guess? The toilet. This one incident is just one of the many cherished moments her family are left with. Skylar was known for her vibrant personality, she was a straight-A student, and she was just not doing school by itself. In order to support herself, she was working part-time at a local Wendy's, while also balancing her academic pursuits and her social life. She was a diligent straight-A student at West Virginia University High School, and she was really good at it. And it was at school that she met her best friends. Skylar Nees, Sheila Eddy, and Rachel Schoff were best friends at University High School near Morgantown, West Virginia. Skylar had known Sheila since they were eight, and Rachel joined the friend group a little later in freshman year. Skylar was a strong support for Sheila and Rachel, who both had divorced parents. Unlike them, Skylar was an only child, and her parents focused a lot on her education and independence. Skylar's mom, Mary, described Skylar as a protective friend, always looking out for Sheila despite her mischievous side. Sheila added fun and excitement to their friendship, even though Skylar often had to step up, be more mature, and keep her in line. Sheila Eddie was like family to Mary and David Knees, often walking into their home without even knocking. Rachel Schoff, on the other hand, came from a strict Catholic family, but she had always admired Sheila's carefree attitude. While Rachel and Skylar did enjoy some sort of freedom, they did not have it to the same extent as Sheila did. This dynamic would later lead to tragedy for Skylar Nees. Everything seemed to be going well for the friends. In fact, they called themselves the Three Musketeers. But in contrast, thanks to the trio's many social media posts, it ultimately became clear that Skylar, Sheila, and Rachel had underlying tensions with each other. Skylar had tweeted things like this May 31st, 2012 post. You are a two-faced bitch and obviously fucking stupid if you thought I wouldn't find out. Another tweet from that spring suggested that Sheila, Eddie, and Rachel Schoff were getting closer, leaving Skylar and me feeling excluded. Just two days before her disappearance, Skylar Nees tweeted, 
It really doesn't take much to piss me off. And later posted, sick of being a fucking home. Thanks, friends. Love hanging out with you all too. The following day, she appeared to reference the drama again, writing, You doing shit like that is why I can never completely trust you. According to Daniel Hoviter, a classmate at UHS, Sheila and Skylar had frequent arguments. Once, during sophomore year, Rachel and Sheila played a prank on Skylar. While at practice for Pride and Prejudice, Sheila pretended to be on a call with Skylar, but she had actually merged the call with Rachel, who was listening in without Skylar knowing. So it is basically a three-way conference call, but Skylar doesn't know that Rachel is in the call. The situation resembled a scene from Mean Girls, but the reality was about to take a much darker turn. Sometimes, truth is stranger and scarier than fiction. On July 5th, 2012, Skylar returned to her family's Star City, West Virginia apartment after working a shift at Wendy's. And on the morning of July 6, 2012, David Neese, Skylar's dad, discovered that she was missing from her room in their Star City apartment. She seemed to have sneaked out overnight, leaving her cell phone charger behind and her window open. David believed that she had planned to return home. Surveillance footage from the investigation showed a cop picking Skylar up from the apartment at 12.30 a.m. on July 6, 2012, later than the timeline provided by her friends. However, the footage was too blurry to identify the vehicle Skylar entered. So, this was kind of relieving for the parents when they saw that Skylar was willingly getting into the vehicle. Their fears of it being a kidnapping kind of eased, not saying it completely vanished, but still, it kind of was, gave them a slight relief. It seemed like she knew who was in the car. The following morning, Skylar did not report for work, which was a first for the responsible teen. The nieces knew that their daughter didn't just run away because a cell phone charger, toothbrush, and toiletries were still in her room. Sensing something was seriously wrong, they reported their daughter missing. Later that day, Sheila Eddy made a phone call to the nieces recounting a story that Rachel, Skylar, and she had sneaked out the previous night. They had driven around Star City, getting high, and then dropped Skylar off near the house. The reason given was that Skylar didn't want to wake her parents by sneaking back in. The story seemed plausible at first, but inconsistencies soon emerged, leading to suspicions about the true events of that night. She also told them that they often snuck out and that they always dropped off each other one block away from their houses so as to not let their parents know. Sheila Eddy's account of picking up Skylar niece at 11pm and dropping her off before midnight contradicted the surveillance footage. The footage revealed Skylar leaving her apartment at 12.30am, not before midnight, but the car departing at 12.35am, after which Skylar disappeared without a trace. Despite this, Sheila and her mother joined the search for Skylar in the neighborhood on July 7. In a twist, Rachel Shove, the other friend involved, was away at Catholic summer camp for two weeks during this time. Wow, like, isn't that weird? I mean, I feel like it is conveniently timed. It just happened to coincide with her friend going missing. The search for Skylar niece continued, but it was like she had just vanished. Rumors swirled around about Skylar Neese attending a house party and overdosing on heroin. It was said that she had died at the party, leading to a panicked disposal of her body. But this just seemed impossible because it was just so unlike Skylar to do something like that. Star City Police Officer Jessica Colbank was suspicious of the situation, and rightfully so. She noticed that Sheila, Eddie, and Rachel Shove's stories were identical, which raised red flags. Their stories were verbatim, the same. No one's story is exactly the same unless it is rehearsed. Everything in my gut was saying, Sheila is acting wrong, Rachel is scared to death. Despite these suspicions, the police lacked sufficient evidence for an arrest. The niece family endured an agonizing wait for the truth about their daughter's disappearance to surface. The discord within the trio appeared to be strong evidence implicating Sheila, Eddie, and Rachel Shove in Skylar's disappearance. 
Chris Berry, a state trooper on the case since August 2012, was convinced that murderers often couldn't keep their crimes secret forever. He believed that they might even boast about their actions. Barry suspected that Rachel Shoff and Sheila Eddy might eventually confess. To gather information, Barry created a fake online identity as a college student and connected with the girls on social media. He hoped their posts would reveal their true feelings about Skylar's disappearance. From their online activity, investigators noticed that Sheila appeared cheerful while Rachel seemed more reserved. Neither showed any signs of distress over their missing friend. Sheila even posted a photo of her and Rachel seemingly unaffected by the situation. Some of their social media posts raised eyebrows like the one from November 5th, 2012 stating, No one on this earth can handle me and Rachel, if you think you can, you're wrong. As rumors spread online, Sheila Eddy and Rachel Shoff started feeling the heat. Accusations on Twitter pointed directly at them, warning that their crime wouldn't stay hidden for long. Despite repeated interviews with authorities, Sheila and Rachel grew more increasingly isolated from their peers, leaning more on each other for support. Officer Cole Banks soon discovered that the car and the security footage belonged to none other than Sheila Eddy. Further investigations revealed additional surveillance footage from nearby businesses on the night of Skylar's disappearance. The footage showed the same car that picked up Skylar Nees near a convenience store in Blackstone, West Virginia, west of Star City and Morgantown. However, both Sheila and Rachel had claimed that they went east that night, exposing their lie. Despite mounting evidence implicating Skylar Nees's best friends as her killers, Law enforcement lacked sufficient evidence to charge them. A confession would ultimately be needed to bring closure to the case. The burden of hiding their crime weighed heavily on Rachel Shoff, leading to a distressing incident on December 28, 2012. A concerned parent dialed 911 reporting their 16-year-old daughter's uncontrollable behavior. She's hitting us. She's screaming. She's running through the neighborhood. The 911 caller was Patricia Shoff. Rachel's mother. In the background, Rachel could be heard crying uncontrollably. Give me the phone. No, no, this is over. This is over. Patricia pleaded with the dispatcher. My husband's trying to contain her. Please hurry. Rachel Shove's emotional outburst led to her confession, and authorities swiftly took her into custody. She soon revealed a chilling truth about Skylar's murder. We stabbed her. As Shof continued, the disturbing details of Skylar Nisa's case became increasingly evident. Rachel revealed that she and Sheila had planned Skylar's murder a month prior. They had discussed it one day in science class and agreed it was something they should do. Rachel and Sheila had planned to kill Skylar just before Rachel left for camp. On the night of the murder, they picked up Skylar, who thought they were going for a drive. Previously, the trio had driven to Brave, a town over the state line to get high. Rachel brought a shovel, Sheila brought two knives, and they also brought cleaning supplies and a change of clothes. Despite the heat, Rachel and Sheila wore hoodies to hide the knives. Skylar, unaware of their intentions, didn't question it. Near the woods in Pennsylvania, where Skylar believed they were going to smoke and get high, Rachel and Sheila got behind her. On three, Rachel said. They attacked her, stabbing her multiple times. Skylar tried to escape at one point, but they stabbed her in the knee, preventing her from running far. Skylar's fate was sealed. As she lay dying, Skylar asked a question, why? When authorities later asked Rachel Shove the same question, she replied, we just didn't like her. <laughs> I mean, wow. So I just don't... I just don't understand what goes through the mind of someone to kill someone that you don't like. In early January 2013, Rachel Shove led investigators to the rural woods where she and Sheila had killed Skylar Nees. The area was snowy and Rachel couldn't recall the exact spot. Despite initially not finding the body, Rachel's confession led the authorities to charging her with murder. A week later, authorities found Skylar Nees' nearly unrecognizable body in the woods. It wasn't until March 13 that a crime lab confirmed it was her. Rachel agreed to wear a wire to help the police get a confession from Sheila. But Sheila continued to put on a show and profess her love for Skylar on social media. In one post on Twitter in March 2013, Sheila wrote, 
Rest easy, Skylar. You will always be my best friend, along with multiple photos. But then just weeks later, Sheila seemingly confirmed her involvement, writing in another Twitter post, We really did go on three. Sheila Eddy was arrested on May 1, 2013, after investigators matched blood samples in her trunk to Skylar's DNA. She pled guilty to first-degree murder in January 2014 and received a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 15 years. Rachel Schilf, guilty of second-degree murder, received a 30-year sentence. David Neese, Skylar Neese's father, believes the two girls don't deserve leniency from the courts. I mean, it's clearly premeditated that they literally planned out this while in science class and a month prior, they were planning the death of their so-called best friend. They should not be given parole. I mean, Skylar was just 16 at the time of her death. They took away her life. They took away a family's daughter and they get to get out in 15 years or the possibility of getting out in 15 years, it's not right. I feel like if you murdered someone, especially like this in cold blood and premeditated, it means that you're a monster. No circumstances, I don't know when it comes to self-defense, the, the situation might be different, but a crime that is as nonchalant as this, I feel like they, they should never be given parole. It should just be life in prison without the possibility of parole. And that is purely my opinion. Skylar's father believes the two girls don't deserve any leniency from the courts. He says, They're both sickos and they're both exactly where they need to be. Away from civilization, locked up like animals. Because that's what they are, they're animals. David Neese occasionally visits a tree in the Pennsylvania woods decorated with the photos of his daughter. He wants it to be a place where people can remember Skylar and the good girl she was. He wants to counter how she was treated by her friends. Both Sheila Eddy and Rachel Shove are currently incarcerated at the Lackin Correctional Center in Mason County, West Virginia. This prison is nicknamed Camp Cupcake for its relatively relaxed environment, allowing inmates to listen to music and then sometimes have personal gaming devices like tablets and so on. I mean, what is this? Like, is this a summer camp? Or is it the punishment for having killed a person? Is this how you treat murderers? It feels like it's a reward vacation for them, where they get to live free of cause on the taxpayers' money. It is absolutely unfair. I mean, human rights has to be upheld, but this is just, this is just crazy to me. According to a former inmate, despite their heinous crimes, Sheila and Rachel have garnered attention and receive a significant amount of fan mail. The two are considered the most famous inmates at the facility. This is just even more sick. There's people out there in the society, they could be among you and they could be among me. They think that the actions that Sheila and Rachel committed are something worth praising and something that should be admired and that is just alarming. Despite Rachel's role in revealing the truth, she and Sheila still maintain regular contact. Uh, there's a podcast called Three on Spotify, I guess it's all also on other platforms, and that is solely committed to this case. I highly recommend checking that out if you're interested to delve more in depth into this case. This just shows that the relationship that Rachel and Sheila had is more complicated and complex, even though Rachel was the reason that they got caught in the first place, especially her confession, the two interact daily and it is a pretty crazy situation. At her first parole hearing in 2023, that is last year, Rachel Schoff revealed that at the time of the murder, she and Sheila Eddy were in a romantic relationship and feared Skylar would expose their secret. Rachel expressed regret for her actions and apologized to Skylar's family, acknowledging the pain she caused. However, Skylar's dad remains unforgiving and rightfully so, emphasizing the irreparable loss of his daughter and advocating for Rachel to remain behind bars. I mean, listen to this. This is what her parole letter contained. I know I can't express how sorry I am for what I've done and the pain I've caused, she said. I loved her. I know what I did was terrible and there's no words to describe the pain that we caused. 
and I know there is nothing I can say or do. I just pray for them all the time and pray for peace in their heart. I would trade places with Skylar so she could be with her loved ones. I just want them to know how deeply sorry I am. And this is what Skylar's dad David had the same response to this. Because of this malicious monster, my child never got a limo for her prom. Instead, she got a ride in a coroner's vehicle. Also, there was no sparkling gown for Skylar, just a body bag. She will never have a certificate of graduation, only a death certificate. This narcissistic, first-degree, cold-blooded killer is not sorry for the brutal murder of my only child. Those are just pure, raw emotions and feelings that you can feel through her statement. And the fact that she had the nerve to say that she would, if she could, exchange and trade places between Skylar so that she would be here with her loved ones is such an out-of-left-field thing to say, especially when you're the reason that she's not here. You murdered her. How can children be capable of such violence? I just don't understand. Is this something to do with childhood trauma? Is it some sort of a fantasy? to see i guess we'll never really understand their minds because if you could it'd be alarming and what do you know rachel shelf was denied parole david and mary niece continue to honor skylar's memory through skylar talks educating others about the consequences of harmful actions and encouraging vigilance in spotting behavior it is so important to me that this never happens again to anyone david emphasized it is the most horrible thing i've ever been through obviously and I don't want anyone else to go through it. I wouldn't wish it on the two people that put me through it. The niece family advocated for Skylar's Law, which mandates amber alerts for all missing children, including those not suspected of being kidnapped. While this measure might not have saved Skylar, who was killed before her disappearance was noticed, it aims to prevent similar tragedies by ensuring timely alerts for missing children in West Virginia. Wow, that was just a tragic case to cover. This just truly knows that you can never really trust anyone, not even your so-called best friends. And that brings us to the end of today's case. What do you guys think? Leave your thoughts in the comments. Stay safe out there. I'll see you in the next episode. Once again, don't forget to rate and follow the podcast on whichever platform you're listening on. It really helps and motivates us to do a lot better. It gives us the feeling that there are actual people on the other side listening to our podcast. If you have any case suggestions, let us know in the comments or in the Q&A area in Spotify. Or you can email us at rottenmindspod at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. And until next time, Goodbye. I'm Kay, and this was Rotten Minds.